Hello everyone, I am Demented Kirby, and welcome to my channel, The Commander Tavern. The Commander Tavern is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic the Gathering format. The Brewery is a series on this channel showcasing my spicy brews and other deck techs. On this episode of The Brewery, I will be discussing my take on a commander from Theros Beyond Death just recently spoiled, Perforos Bronze Blooded. If you like this deck or any of the cards I'll be mentioning throughout the video, please consider using my TCG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find that link down in the description. It'll really help out the channel. Other ways you can help support the channel is with my Patreon. Patrons get early access to scheduled videos on YouTube and higher tier patrons get access to the VIP section of my Discord server as well. You can find a link to that down in the description too. Alright, let's get back to the episode. Perforos Bronze Blooded is a 7 6 enchantment creature god with indestructible for 4 generic and 1 red. Once your devotion to red is 5 or greater, he's a creature. He also has a lord ability giving all of your creatures haste. However, none of that really matters. What matters is his final ability. For 2 generic and 1 red, he's basically a sneak attack for red and artifact creatures, which is fine since those are pretty much what you'll be limited to in a mono red commander deck, but I'll get into that later on. He might cost one more than sneak attack, but it's definitely a small price to pay for an indestructible sneak attack right in the command zone. His ability might cost two generic more than sneak attack, but again, I feel like this is a small enough price to pay in order to have an indestructible sneak attack in the command zone. Either way, the deck is also running sneak attack for redundancy, in case something were to happen to our commander. I always loved sneak attack, so now that Perforos has been spoiled a couple of hours ago, I knew I had to brew with him. So let's see what kind of tech we can use to take even more advantage out of this effect. Sundial of the Infinite is a great way to keep your creatures at the end of the turn. Just wait until all those delay triggers enter the stack when the end step begins and then activate the Sundial. The Sundial then removes everything on the stack, meaning that the creatures you snuck onto the battlefield aren't sacrificed. Your turn's going to end anyways, so there's nothing to lose there. Lifeline is also a great way to keep the creatures you snuck on the board. When the end step begins, your creatures get sacrificed to the delayed trigger. However, with Lifeline and any other creature on the battlefield, keep in mind that it doesn't have to be your own creatures. Lifeline will also work as long as there's a single creature even on your opponent's side. Those creatures will return to the battlefield at the beginning of the next end step. So once the present turn ends, at the end of the step of the following turn, those creatures you snuck in will return to the battlefield, essentially cheated into play without needing to be sacrificed later on. Another thing you can do while those creatures are in your graveyard is make a token of them with Felden of the Third Path. This is a great way to capitalize on those creatures in your graveyard. That way there are more synergistic pieces working all together within the deck with varying aspects of it. Felden is like the secret partner of the deck since he doubles the value of sneaking in creatures since he can capitalize on them being in the graveyard afterwards, especially for creatures with enter the battlefield abilities. You can also take advantage of the sacrifice clause with Skull Clamp. For just one more mana, you can equip it to the creature that you snuck onto the battlefield so that when they die at the end of the turn, they can at least draw you two cards while you're at it. Oh, and they'll be stronger by one point too. On the topic of drawing, you can also cheat in creatures to draw cards and take even more value of this ability. Sandstone Oracle will draw you cards until you have the same amount as an opponent. Since we'll be cheating a lot of creatures but also casting a bunch of cheap spells we'll see soon enough, you're bound to have a zero card hand. Drawing a bunch of cards with Sandstone Oracle is great. Runehorn Hellkite is also a great way to draw cards since you can exile it from your graveyard in order to wheel and get a fresh hand of 7 cards. So it's a 5-5 flyer when snuck in and then a wheel in the graveyard. Speaking of flying wheels, the deck also runs Dragon Mage. Singing in this dragon is great since you wheel into a new hand when it connects. So this refuels your hand with creatures to potentially sneak in during your next turn. Another wheel on a body is Magus of the Wheel. Now, the Magus is cheaper to cast than to sneak in, but since Perforos gives all of our creatures haste, you can activate its ability the same turn it enters the battlefield. That way you can wheel into a new hand of 7 cards. You can also draw cards thanks to Combustible Gear Hulk. It might be conditional draw, but it can also be political draw. Maybe you can use it to owe a favor to an opponent in order to have them allow you to draw 3 cards. Or maybe an opponent owed you a favor, so you cashed it in for the card draw. However, even if that doesn't happen, and the opponent has you self mill 3 instead, it's still a win-win for us. This deck is chocked full of fatties, so if you happen to mill any of them or multiple ones, we can potentially deal over 30 damage to that opponent. But we'll soon see those fatties soon enough. Other creatures we can sneak in in order to abuse their triggered abilities are Worm Coil Engine and Scuttling Doom Engine. These engines are both 6-6 and they both trigger when they die. Worm Coil Engine makes two 3-3 tokens, each one with one of its abilities, and Scuttling Doom Engine deals 6 damage to an opponent. 
That means that with the latter, it's possible to deal 12 damage to an opponent with it. With Felden, since the tokens we make are sacrificed at the end of the turn, those tokens will also trigger like their original counterparts for double the value. Unlike these two engines, Meteor Golem triggers when it enters the battlefield instead of when it dies. Being able to destroy a non-land permanent is great in mono red decks since this helps get rid of enchantments, something red really can't do. The other ways we can do that are included in the deck, such as Chaos Warp and Scour from Existence. These instants are amazing since they can get rid of anything at instant speed. Hopefully, Chaos Warp doesn't take you out of the frying pan just to put you into the fire. Getting back to Meteor Golem, you can also take the mileage from this Golem even further thanks to Felden. Since it's incredibly easy to run out of steam thanks to this ability, you need to be continuously drawing through the deck. We already saw how we can do so with the creatures, so let's see what other spells we have to dig through our deck. Faithless Looting, Wild Guess, and Tormenting Voice are a given. We need to discard with them, but if we have one land too many in our hand, we can just discard it in order to draw into things we can play at that same turn. Honor the God of Pharaoh does the same thing, but it requires an additional mana to do so. At least that extra mana gets us a creature token. That might not seem like much, but recall the lifeline. We can also use it as a chump blocker in a pinch. Thrill of Possibility is the best of these though since it's an instant. Besides these cheap draw spells, I'm also running straight up wheel effects with cards like Memory Jaw, Wheel of Fortune, and Reforge the Soul. The deck already has the previously mentioned wheel effects, but it doesn't hurt to have even more in order to ensure we don't run out of steam. This is why I'm also running Elixir of Immortality. Since we're going to be sneaking in our fatties most of the time, the Elixir helps us put them back into the library in order to draw back into them later on. We can also activate it in response to an opponent attempting to exile our graveyard. The Elixir isn't the only way we reshuffle our graveyard back into our library, but we'll get into that soon enough. Now this brew is incredibly straightforward. Get Perforos out as quickly as possible in order to cheat in fatties as consistently as possible. This is the reason for all the card draw effects in the deck. However, Perforos costs 5 mana and its ability costs 3 mana each time. Suffice it to say that we're going to need a significant amount of mana resources, especially if we want to consistently get a fatty out on turn 1. But I'll explain that in greater detail later on. The deck's running Mox Diamond, Mox Opal, Chrome Mox, Mox Amber, Mana Crypt, Mana Vault, and Soul Ring. Of these, the most important ones for turn run brutalities are Chrome Mox, Mana Crypt, Mana Vault, and Soul Ring. Additionally, the deck also has Lotus Petal and Simeon Spirit Guide for that gossamer of red mana that's only truly clutch on turn run. Rituals also have a great source of cheap early game mana advantage like Seething Song, Desperate Ritual, and Piratic Ritual. Having these in your opening hand are definitely key for turn 1 plays. That being said, they're still great later on in the game in case we had to hard cast any of our fatties. These aren't the only rituals though, since the deck also runs Iron Crag Feet and Mana Geyser. These cost a bit more to cast, but give way more mana than the previous rituals. There are also sorceries instead of instants, so you're also limited to when you can cast them. Obviously, Iron Crag Feet is the only one of these two that matter having in your opening hand. Amazingly, there's an unbelievable amount of turn 1 opening hands that can eliminate a player before they even experience their first untap step. But I'll get into that soon enough. Even though the deck aims to be as consistent as possible in the very early game, we still need more consistent mana for the rest of the game. That's why Mana Geyser is in the deck. It's not so good on turn 1, but if cast on turn 3 or 4, when you have 3 opponents who've each tapped 3 lands, then it just got you 9 red mana. Another card that depends on opponents board states to be good is Dockstide Extortionist. It's cheap to cast, but it's not worth it to do so if your opponents don't have artifacts and enchantments in play to make it worth it. That being said, it is an enter the battlefield effect so you can definitely take advantage of it with Felden of the Third Path. Catalyst Elemental and Vessel of Volatility are ways to store mana so to speak in order to have explosive turns earlier than possible. For example, playing Vessel of Volatility now will give you that mana bank on a future turn. Runaway Steamkin is another way to store mana. Every time you cast a red spell like all of the looting spells, wheels, and rituals, it'll get a plus one plus one counter. Then for every three plus one plus one counters you remove from it, you get three red mana. Other mana rocks in the deck include Heart of Ramos. Heart of Ramos can either always give you one red mana or give you two red mana once. So just like Catalyst Elemental, you can pay three mana now to get two red mana later. Iron Mirror is the only mana dork in the deck because there really aren't that many mana dorks for mono red. The reason it's in the deck is because it's cheap to cast and it's good to have around for lifeline, but you can swap it out for Arcane Signet if you want speed instead. Another mana dork in the deck is Treasonous Ogre. You need to pay 3 life each time you want to add red mana to your mana pool, but if you're able to cheat in fatties for the win, then life is just another resource. 
Pyromancer's Goggles and Gilded Lotus both cost 5 mana, but they're incredibly good. Gilded Lotus alone is enough to activate Perforos once or sneak attack thrice. Pyromancer's Goggles is great because if used to cast a ritual, it'll double that ritual. For example, if you use Pyromancer's Goggles to help cast Iron Crack Feet, you just added 14 red mana to your mana pool. Nyx Lotus costs 4 mana and enters the battlefield tapped, but when you tap it, it gives you the same amount of red mana as your devotion to red, so it has the potential to give you more red mana than any of the previously mentioned cards. You can also get small bursts of mana each turn thanks to Chandra. Both Chandra Novice Pyromancer and Chandra Torch of Defiance can give you 2 red mana. This is great for early-ish turns when you only need a slight boost in mana to really bring down a fatty in order to terrorize the table. Koth of the Hammer is the final planeswalker in the deck and he's included for the same reasons. Not only can he give you 1 red mana for each mountain you control, but he can also untap a mountain. That way he can also reliably give you 2 red mana each turn like the Chandra's can. Lands that can help boost mana are Ancient Tomb, Crystal Vein, and Nikto's Shrine to Nyx. Nikto's gets better later in the game when you've assembled a good board state, but Ancient Tomb and Crystal Vein are great for that turn 1 epicness. Crystal Vein is similar to Heart of Ramos in that it can either always give you 1 mana or give you 2 mana once. Temple of the False God is another land in the deck that gives 2 mana, but you need to have 5 lands in play to do so, so it's definitely a land you want in the mid game. As for the rest of the lands, they're just 32 basic mountains. That way there aren't any lands that enter the battlefield tapped so we can really be as quick as possible. Either way, producing a bunch of mana is great because then you can sink it into Earthquake or Rolling Earthquake. As long as you have more life than your opponents, you can win off of these spells. Rolling Earthquake can potentially wipe the board of creatures as well since it hits creatures without horsemanship. So in any case, these spells can help clear the board of most potential blockers. Alright, so the moment you've been waiting for, the beaters of the deck. These are the creatures that make opponents shake in their boots the moment they see Perforos in your command zone because they'll no doubt know what'll eventually be cheated in. And those are Darksteel Colossus and Blightsteel Colossus. The Darksteel version might not be as scary since it doesn't have infect. However, it's still an 11-11 indestructible trampler that will return to your library at the end of the turn you sneak it in. Keep in mind that you can also use Perforos' ability defensively, so cheating in an indestructible 11-11 at instant speed is an insane combat trick. Blightsteel Colossus is definitely the one you want to use offensively. It's also incredibly easy to sneak in on turn 1. In fact, there's a surprising amount of opening hands that can get us a turn 1 Blightsteel Colossus. I will explain a couple of opening hands so you can get an idea of how to achieve it. I will provide some more examples in the description below. These opening hands can also be done with a similar cards, so there's no singular god hand for this. Also, keep in mind that this will eliminate only one player at the start of a game, so you still have to get rid of the remaining players. So doing this might make you the arch enemy, but without a scheme deck. Hopefully, no one dropped a planes in order to hit your Blightsteel Colossus with a path to exile or source to plowshares, or counters Perforos with force of will. Alright, so without further ado, let's see some examples on how we can get that turn 1 Blightsteel Colossus. This first one doesn't even need for you to have a full opening hand of 7 cards, so you can mulligan it down to 6. All you need is Mana Crypt, Mana Vault, Simeon Spirit Guide or Lotus Petal, Seething Song, a mana producing land, and obviously Blightsteel Colossus. First play the land, then cast Mana Crypt. Tap both to add 3 mana to your mana pool. Use one of them to cast Mana Vault. Tap it to add 3 more mana to your mana pool. Exile Simeon Spirit Guide from your hand to add 1 red mana to your mana pool. Use that red mana and 2 mana of any type to cast Seething Song. You now have 8 mana in your mana pool, where enough of it is red in order to do what's next, which is cast Perforos from your command zone, and then use the remaining mana in your pool to cheat in Blightsteel Colossus. It has haste, so swing away. The next example can be done without Mana Crypt, but you do need to have 7 cards in your opening hand. Those being a Mountain, Simeon Spirit Guide, Lotus Petal, Soul Ring, Desperate Ritual, or Pyretic Ritual, Iron Crag Feet, and Blightsteel Colossus. First play the Mountain. Tap it to cast Soul Ring. Cast Lotus Petal, and sacrifice it for 1 red mana. Exile the Simeon Spirit Guide for 1 red mana. Tap the Soul Ring for 2 colorless mana. Use 1 colorless and 1 red mana to cast Desperate Ritual. You now have 1 colorless and 4 red mana in your mana pool. Use the colorless and 3 red mana to cast Iron Crack Feet, adding 7 red mana to your mana pool for a total of 8 red mana. Use 5 to cast Perforos from the command zone. 
Then, use the remaining 3 mana to sneak in Blysteel Colossus. Then, swing in to eliminate a hapless opponent from out of nowhere. Not to fear though, these two colossi aren't the only fatties you can cheat in. These are just as brutal, maybe more. However, these aren't for turn 1. That's because they're all Eldrazi. The deck's running Path Raider of Ulamog, Ulamog's Crusher, and Artisan of Kozilek for the Annihilator. They can be chum blocked, but at least your opponents have to sacrifice permanence before they can assign any blockers. The other Eldrazi are the legal titans, Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger, Ulamog the Infinite Gyre, and Kozilek Butcher of Truth. The Infinite Gyre and the Butcher of Truth also have Annihilator, which is pretty devastating. But the Ceaseless Hunger can be quite brutal since it exiles the top 20 cards of Defending Player's Library. What's great about the Zendikar versions is that when they're sacrificed at the end of the turn, you get to shuffle your graveyard back into your library. So, similarly to Elixir of Immortality, you're able to continue recycling through your deck. Now, I know what you're thinking. Perforos can only sneak in a creature if it's red or artifact. Well, I'd say to keep in mind that the deck is also running Sneak Attack. But, I still have two more cards to show you. Painter Servant and Mycosynth Lattice. If you name red with the Scarecrow, you can sneak in the Eldrazi with Perforos since they are now red creatures. You can also do the same with the Lattice. Since the Eldrazi are now artifact creatures, you can sneak them in with Perforos. This brew is just an idea of how to build around Perforos Bronze Blooded. I know that he's only been spoiled for a couple of hours, so there might be more goodies in Theros Beyond Death that can be used in this deck. However, with what's already available in the current card pool, I was able to brew quite the oppressive deck. Since this deck is essentially an indestructible sneak attack in the command zone, keep in mind that you can fill it with as many creatures or of any kind as you like since you can really abuse its ability with fat and hasty beaters and or blockers as well as enter the battlefield and or death trigger creatures. As is, this deck is a lot of fun to pilot and play. If you're interested in the deck list of this spicy rue of mine, you can find a link to it down in the description. I would like to thank all my patrons for supporting me and a quick shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the brewers, for their patronage. I'd also like to thank anyone using my TCG Player affiliate link. That also helps out the channel. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of The Brewery on the Commander Tavern. I am Demented Kirby, and happy brewing.